okay friends so for our next session uh we've got three people with us together uh so we have simon shirwell we have christy mahu then dr arif ibrahim so uh simon is presently a grade two classroom teacher uh for, for the edmonton public schools she became interested in teaching for peace after attending two summer institutes focused on gandhian principles at the United States of America. Simone believes strongly that young children have an important role to play as peace advocates for their communities. Christy Mahood is from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. She will be exploring various ways that she has recently adapted her practice for teaching peace in an on online environment using Gandhian pedagogy and viewing her practice through a lens of slow peace. Dr. Arif Ibrahim, is an educator who values practicing leadership alongside school staff in order to impact and enhance the opportunities students and teachers have to influentially grow and develop as learners and people. So with this, I invite Simone, Christy, and Dr. Arif. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that you have the permission to share your screens. So in case you want, would want uh, to share your presentations on your own, you may do so, or you may ask me to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, would you be able to share uh, your, our presentation? <laughs> sure, sure, Christy, sure, just a sec. Excellent. Can you go to the next slide, please? So we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, Inuit footsteps who have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you. Can you go to the next slide, please? Our session aspires to communicate some of our individual and collective journeys as we seek to develop our own approaches to pedagogies of peace. We have adapted the label slow peace to describe the work we are doing. It grows out of an engagement with the Gandhian principles and Rob Nixon's understanding of slow violence. We begin with key Gandhian concepts such as equality, ahimsa, non-possession, non-exploitation, trusteeship, violence, and non-violence. A particular approach to peace and nonviolence follows from Gandhian principles, beginning from the understanding that much of the violence in the world is slow violence that goes largely unnoticed because it happens over extended periods of time, is not necessarily contained to one geographic space, continues through practices and processes that are normalized and sanctioned, and largely affects the most marginalized and dispossessed people of the world. That attention to any form of violence requires attention to a practice of nonviolence that would address it. Slow peace must begin by stepping back to understand the taken for granted practices that contribute to various forms of slow violence, with particular attention to the ways in which these practices are embodied in the work we, are, we do as educators and researchers. It is important to focus on a specific form of violence writ large, as well as thinking about day-to-day -day practices that sustain the type of violence. To be effective, slow peace requires a commitment to sustained action through a variety of forms and practices. Arif, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Christy. Well, and, and hello to everyone. This is a, an absolute honor for us here in Canada from Edmonton to be able to share some insights with you. Um, the perspective that I'll be sharing after Christy's uh, wonderful introduction is um, that, that step into the school, the step into the classrooms of working with a foundational um, character education 
component that could help students understand the purpose of not only celebrating, acknowledging different cultures, but also seeing how these different cultures are interconnected in our journey towards uh, humanitarian peace. So regardless of your race, religion, these are universal terms. Um, these animals that you see represented here are animals that are easily identifiable by many people around the world. And so when we can bring that piece of a connected humanity to our students, as well as the connection to our environment, to nature, I believe we have a wonderful opportunity for sustainable understanding of what peace can actually look like in action. And, and our hope is that that crosses uh, generation after generation. So I share with you. Arif, uh, Arif, if I may interrupt, would you like to share your own screen as you mentioned? No, that's fine. Uh, I'll just, can I just signal you? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Um, so these are the grandfather teachings taken from the First Nations Manian Inuit culture. And when you think of the word grandfather or grandmother, there's something very special about that, that use of language. It talks about historical context. It talks about foundational understandings. It, it talks about passing on traditions through the, the, through the art of storytelling. And that's, that's really uh, what the seven sacred teachings represent. They are a representation of animals. And the animals remind us how deeply connected humans are to the greater environment that we live within. And it reminds us that all of us carry that, that symbolic um, opportunity to make this world a better place. And so what we had a chance to do is we had a chance to bring in the seven secret teachings into our school. And because they're young children, kindergarten to grade six, which is roughly around five years old to 12 years old, we were able to use something like this because they all love animals. They all can relate to animals. And so you can see that the eagle represents love. The buffalo represents respect. The bear represents courage. Sasquatch, here known in, in Canada as the Bigfoot, uh, represents honesty. <coughs> and the beaver represents wisdom. And the wolf represents humility. And the turtle represents truth. Now, each and every one of these animals um, are connected to these terms very strategically. Next slide, please. And I'll talk about that connection in just a moment, but I wanted to bring to light this beautiful, I'm almost, almost poetic statement. Um, it says, carry our song to where we belong, where the stars and the skies become one. And again, I just wanted to remind everybody that our choice to bring in the sensation <laughs> teachings into our classroom uh, really, was an opportunity to show that interconnectedness, not only with the living beings on the planet, but giving recognition to a higher spirit above if someone chooses to believe in that uh, concept as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I wasn't going to go through each of the animals, but I thought it would be important to at least show you an example. So we see here the wolf, and the wolf represents the idea of humility. So humility means knowing others are important and respecting what they can do. The wolf represents humility because the wolf knows that every member of its pack is equally important. And so you can now start to understand if we were to use this understanding to link it to a character education trait with our students, it has so much more meaning. And it gives teachers an opportunity to talk about the idea of humility and being humble in many different ways with, with an animal representation that they can then connect back to their own personal lives. So for example, if they were in a, a gym class 
and they were doing a team activity. Well, how will that team be successful if they're not all working together? If we're not sharing the ball, if we're not letting everyone have a chance. So that's how we can talk about the idea of humility. Next slide, please. And this is another example of, you know, moving from the adults in the building talking about the, the, the traits to students articulating their understanding in the traits. And so this is a main bulletin board outside the school office and every class every month puts up um, their representation of one of the traits. This is the trait of courage that is represented by the bear. So you can see a bear paw. And what the students did is they wrote within the bear paw how they're going to show courage um, as they live and breathe each and every day. So again, the important part of this is how are students making meaning of it? Next slide, please. And I just wanted to end with this slide here and showing that, you know, it is really important that our students see the seven sacred teachings taught not only by the teachers or the adults in the building, but we also invite our First Nations, Maiden, Inuit brothers and sisters into our school in some way. And if it's virtual, that's fine too, because we have that access now. But for them to speak directly to something that is deeply connected to their culture, because we want to make this as authentic as we possibly can. We don't want to um, we don't want to take away any of the authenticity of the meanings of the seven sacred teachings. And so you can see at the bottom of the screen, this would link to a video where we have um, one of our First Nations brothers talking about the idea of love, how the eagle represents that, why the eagle represents that. And um, it's beautifully wrapped around very, very important key messages for students to be able to relate to. So I, I thank you so much for allowing me uh, this opportunity to share about the seven sacred teachings. And Simone, I, I, we're moving to you. Oh, I think it's mine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so, that's okay. Thank you so much, Arif, for uh, sharing how you are bringing um, these seven sacred teachings into your school and into your community and hoping that these students um, continue the lessons of peace. Uh, throughout their lives. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, shifting online, but keeping still that idea of slow peace and Gandhian pedagogy. After the first spring, when everyone was sent online and the following school year was about to begin, our school board let families opt in or out for online or in-person instruction every 10 to 12 weeks. Last year, in order to provide flexibility and choice, um, the need for online teachers was solely dependent on parental choice. I had thought I was going to be teaching in person, but within two days uh, before school started, I learned I was being assigned online to online instruction. I had to plan and pivot quickly. I started with ahimsa. Ahimsa means to me to do no harm in thought, word, or deed. Did my students have access to materials that represented them and their cultures and interests? Could they see themselves in the picture books and stories and lessons that I now had to provide online? How is my daily instruction and the language I was using supporting them and adding to the respect they deserve and meeting their needs? Ahimsa helped me ask and answer, how can I include everyone and respect the individual needs? With the idea of Ahimsa in mind, I started looking into trauma-informed practice. The saying, we are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat, pretty much sums up trauma-informed practice. I had anywhere from 32 to 36 students from 7 to 12 different schools every 10 to 12 weeks from across the city. I needed to make sure that my practice was trauma-informed and empathetic to varying situations. That led to a come-as-you-are approach. I had to let go of some of the notions of what is proper and formal and embrace the uniqueness of the situations. I had students show up in class in any manner of placement in the home, inside and out, and in all manners of clothing. In, <clears throat> excuse me, all manners of clothing. I got to see more of my who my students were um, and got to see more of who each, um, they got to see more of who each other were as well. In embracing a come as you are approach, it became another vehicle for my students to learn about each other and for me to understand 
and for my students to understand a much deeper and authentic level. Imagine a community where you can be accepted just as you are. Again, thinking about ahimsa and trauma-informed practice, I had the students do kindness journals, where I challenged my students to do one kind thing a day for themselves or their families and others or the environment and share with us. Um, we also practice gratitude practices, stopping daily to pause and be grateful for things that are big or small, learning an attitude of gratitude. I tried to think of ways to highlight and explore creativity, practicing, sharing, and celebrating all forms of creative expression um, with weekly challenges to try something creative and share it with our community. We had bi-weekly talent shows and show and shares where each student had the opportunity to sign up for a two minute slot. Um, so many students shared singing, dancing, playing an instrument, biking, skateboarding, animal training, Lego building, drawing, cooking, gardening, painting, speaking different languages, video games, magic tricks, poetry, martial arts, to name a few. Reinforcing everyone has an opportunity to contribute and everyone's contributions are equally valued. We started with, uh, as well as an initiative, Everyday Actions for Peace Challenge. Again, challenging students to take actions to do something to further their peace, both large and small within themselves or in their homes or in their communities. Staying connected with homeschools. I often received information from my students' homeschools and made sure they were staying connected, making sure they felt comfortable knowing that they could be a part of many communities. Um, some students were a little apprehensive that um, because they were across the city, what happened to my old school? Where are my old friends? How come I'm in this class? Um, again, just giving them that comfort level of being able to know that they can be a part of many communities and, um, and it still counted. I also made sure that they had an opportunity to join in any contests or special events, artists in residency, online classes and assemblies that my home school hosted. Um, something I did both in person and transitioned as well online was highlighting ordinary people who do extraordinary things. In Canada, many schools participate in Terry Fox Day. Terry Fox, for those of you that don't know, was a young man who had cancer and lost his leg to cancer. He wanted to raise money for cancer research, especially for research for young children and youth with cancer. So he decided to run across Canada um, to raise money. Unfortunately, he was unable to finish due to his cancer returning and he passed away. People across Canada run or walk on Terry Fox Day in memory to continue to raise funds for cancer and symbolically help him finish his goals of running across Canada. I had a student who was in the mountains of Lebanon due to his mother having to take care of her parents during COVID outbreak. Um, he took part in our Terry Fox Day and ran around the mountain village with some help of his village friends um, and the kids and took pictures. It was a great way for my students to stay connected with us and to help others understand what Terry Fox did. I like to highlight other ordinary people that have done extraordinary things, both locally, nationally and internationally, every few days so that my students can see examples of amazing people who took action for their causes. We did a lot of exploring diversity through music, drumming and dance. The internet has been an amazing opportunity. Um, we were able to connect with Lucas Coffee and have an online drumming residency. Coffee connected school groups to various drummers from around the world. And each week the students were able to learn different styles of drumming and different cultures. They had the opportunity to learn from First Nations drummers, drummers from India, Brazil, China, United States and Canada. We also had the same, uh, also had another opportunity to enjoy um, a, a dancing residency, where again, we learned um, and the students learned to uh, various Christy? styles of, yeah. Chrissy, I'm just going to jump in because um, you're running to about six minutes left. So I'm, okay. I'm hoping that uh, Simone sure, has I some have, time uh, to speak One last well. paragraph. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, Yep, so they had dancing residency. Um, we do a lot of, on the next following slides, examples of social emotional learning. So knowing yourself, how you are feeling, ways of dealing with emotions big and small, and encouraging um, students to engage positively. So on the next three slides are examples of some of our social emotional conversations that we have with kids. Um, and these slides came from the Bakersfield City School District. 
And lastly, just uh, developing a community of practice with colleagues, um, knowing that you can build on and with each other. Lydia? Go ahead, thank you. You can move the next three slides down. They're just through some social emotional learning that we would go through as a class. So during our morning meetings. Thank you. Okay, this is me. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Arif. Um, I'm going to speak quickly because I understand, Rava, that we are running out of time, but that's okay. I am known for speaking quickly. I just wanted to make a couple of connections with the earlier speakers. Just the idea that um, working with the children and the youth coming in from the periphery rather than being in the middle. And I'm going to share with you a project that I'm doing with my grade two students right now. So Ukraine has been in our mind. Um, I have students coming to me saying, is this the start of World War Three? Uh, lots of fear, lots of lack of understanding. Um, as Ziad said, the media only paints the violence, um, needing more armaments that Catherine spoke about, all of those things. And these are floating around the minds of seven-year-olds. So in the past, um, I did a Planting Seeds for Peace project, and I thought it was time to bring that back. As we've learned, the sunflower is the national flower of Ukraine. So my students in grade two, as well as a class of five, six students, have been decorating envelopes with sunflowers. And if you go to the previous slide, it shows that. And in each packet, we're putting five sunflower seeds, we are distributing these packages of seeds to every student in our school. We found out that we needed 249 of them. So lots of curricular outcomes are happening, but my real goal is to let these students know, although Ukraine is far away, we are connected and supplying armaments is not the only way that we can support Ukrainians. So it may seem a very small thing to plant seeds for peace, but it's giving them something concrete that they can do. When these sunflowers begin blooming in our community, we are going to be connected with the people of Ukraine and the idea of growth and that peace can be grown and planted, that idea that it's a seed and we need to continue to work with that. So I don't want my students to feel powerless. I want them to feel they have some power, even though to them it may seem small, but the act of planting a seed, that idea of nonviolence, of peace is so, so important to them. So not only are we going to be distributing these packets of seeds, we've also asked for donations so that people can feel that they're also doing something concrete, toonies or loonies, whatever you have, and we will collect them. We've decorated jars with the Ukrainian flag, and we are going to collect the money and give it to a local organization that is supporting um, the many refugees that are fleeing out of Ukraine. So I guess lots of connections for me, the idea of working with youth and young children, the idea that um, they do have a voice and small acts are a really great way to build that idea of peace and non-violence. So I'm going to wrap up my quick little speech there. And I'm not sure if we have some time for a little um, conversation or not. Reva, I'll let you fill me in on that. I, I, I think actually we're going to have to move on, Simone, but hopefully some of you can stay and uh, we'll have larger conversations as we go along. Um, 
I do want to thank you, um, the three of you, for, for being here and for being part of this. And I continue to be amazed by all of you and all of the wonderful things that you're doing. Um, Gary, I wonder if we could play the next audio clip. And then uh, many of you are here for our next presenter after that, who, will, who I will introduce then. Okay, so Gary, the audio clip. <laughs> 